Today's guest joins a list. I think I said this about another Welsh guest, but I can use it again here. Joins an illustrious list that includes Rhys Evans, Ruth Jones, Matthew Rhys, Michael Sheen, and probably another one that I'm forgetting. In other words, my Welsh guests. She um, appeared, I'm going to say, around the turn of the century in the public consciousness. Maybe it was a little bit later, maybe it was a little bit earlier. We, we, we can find out from uh, Cardiff, originally became known as someone with the voice of an angel, and then went on an interesting sort of route. I swerved the word journey, well done went on an interesting route to where she is now and this new project that she uh, particularly wants to talk about, as well as fielding all the old questions that she gets asked every time, uh, it, which is more of kind of a, a, a wellness thing, a, a healing thing. It, it's very, very interesting. Ladies and gentlemen, sit down, open your ears, your eyes and your hearts to Charlotte Church. Remember, you can listen to the full-length episode wherever you get your podcasts. Hello, is this all working? My God, Charlotte, the years have not been kind to you. <laughs> you look very different. How is, uh, how is this sounding? We've got an external mic, so we're just making it's, it's sure. It's a bit quiet. Hi. Hello. I've not managed to get dressed yet. How are you? Well, you know... Relaxation is the key. Um, I'm very well. Now, I'm going to say I don't think we've met. Uh, uh, we've never properly met, have we? I don't think we have properly met, no. No, no. Good, good. I was hoping you were, you were going to say to me, don't you remember we had a very long conversation one night about so-and-so? But obviously, super aware of you and and fellow Welsh, and, and even in, in it's lovely just hearing your voice. Ah, same, same to you, Rob. I've been a big fan for a long time, but yeah, we've never actually met. Our paths haven't crossed. As small as the village sometimes seems, it has kept us apart. <laughs> it has, but the, we're, we're putting that right now. Yeah. I'm starting to sound like Uncle Bryn because I'm talking <laughs> to somebody with a Welsh accent. Oh. I was like, I'm talking to Charlotte Church. <laughs> Let's look at you and this uh, popular word journey you've been on. You were famous from even younger than I thought. When were you first in the public eye? So my first album came out when I was 12. Um, and <sighs> I, I did a li you know, little bits and bobs of TV things before that. But really, it was when I was 12 that Voice of an Angel came out and you know, my life and my family's life changed forever. Proper, you know, when I think when I think back on it now, it was a proper, it's like a fairy tale, you know? It was like, it's, it's mythic. Plucked from obscurity. Yeah, but it, as, as, as a fairy tale, though, but is it is it a Grimm's fairy tale? Is it because, because you, you say to me, uh, you were 12, and my reaction as a parent yeah. and, and giving in to the kind of Welsh pessimism is, oh, God. Oh, the, all I see are the dangers, yeah, the, and and the things that can screw you up. Totally, and, and, if I, and the thought of you dealing with record company people and television people, ee, that kind of makes me tense. Yeah, absolutely. But look, fairy tales are pretty grisly um, tales. Um, fairy tales are very rarely. Um, you know, all sweetness and light and, and about how fairies are having such a lovely time. Um, so, I mean, it's like they, it, my, my early life, I suppose, being famous was extraordinarily exciting. Um, uh, as is what, what often happens with fairy tales, you know, the first bit's cracking. <laughs> cracking, it's tidy. <laughs> we did get to travel the world. We did some incredible things and we met some amazing people, like th some of the most important people in Give the world. Give me quickly the top three things, the, the, top, the top three experiences, right? Not, 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 not in order or sending, just the three things in that young first flush that you look back on and say, wow. I think 
being in Japan, being in Tokyo for the first time, it was such a huge culture shock. Um, and because I was only there very quickly for like five days, then the, the press I had to do was crazy. It was like, uh, I mean, that, I, that was one of the most like famous I'd ever felt. You know, getting to a country and it was just like, <laughs> there was just loads of TV and cameras and, and it was just like, oh my gosh, I've never been to Japan. How do you know me? And, you know, it was, um, that was, you know, very weird and the, the culture being so different, but I loved it. I lapped it up. So Tokyo, going to Tokyo for the first time has got to be one. Um, probably meeting Bill Clinton at the White House is another. Um, again, I was 13 um, and we just couldn't believe we were there. It was really surreal being in the Oval Office. And we visited the White House a couple of times after that. I sang at George Bush's inauguration. I sang at a few of the um, Christmas in Washington gigs. And so then that became a bit old hat, but that first time. And meeting Muhammad Ali as well at the White House was pretty amazing. Tell me, tell me first of all, before we move on to Muhammad Ali, for heaven's sake. Yeah. Um, <laughs> tell me about Clinton, because I was at a thing once and that he was at, and it was over a whole evening, so I was able to observe him. Yeah. Uh, I didn't meet him, but I was watching him. And... I could see that kind of charm and that laser-like thing. And he would take their hand and he would look in their eye and he would not let go of that hand. And he would gaze into that eye and just talk to them like they were the only person. Did you witness the charm and, and the people skills? Both Bill and Hillary were like immensely skillful at um, really... Uh, making you feel like they they actually wanted to meet you and they were they were genuinely yeah. interested i mean i've met a lot of members yeah. of the royal family and other politicians and other world leaders and they just aren't they they're not you know they're not really interested <laughs> they don't want to be there and they can't even be they can't be bothered to pretend whereas yeah bill and hillary were really um in it you know whether they were just yeah. like going totally method um, or whether they were just like genuinely <laughs> interested because actually in life it's probably better just to commit and be genuinely interested in, in, in the people that you're, you're meeting and whatever you're doing in the moment. At that same event, right, here's my funny Bill Clinton story. Uh, also at that event was Uma Thurman oh, and gosh. James Nesbitt. Oh. And at one point, Jimmy came over to me and he said, he said, I just, he said, I just met, just met the president. I said, how did it go? He said, not good. I said, what happened? He said, he was talking to, he was, I can't do the voice. He was, he was talking to Uma Thurman, right? And uh, I said, oh yeah. So I went over and I said, Mr. President, I just want to say, and he said, and Uma had this dress with this long train, right? And he said, I just want to say, Mr. President, thank you for your, your work on the peace process. And, you know, I want to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you very much. And I said, what did he say to you? And he said, son, you're standing on Uma's train. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Oh, you start out so just ever aware of the ladies. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. OK, so Bill Clinton. So going to Japan, Bill Clinton. And then what about Ali? So Muhammad Ali, I met at I sang at George Bush's inauguration. No, he couldn't. It couldn't have been that. I can't remember which time at the White House. Oh, I'm on a minute. Are you telling me you don't remember the specifics of when you met the greatest of all time? That's fantastic. No, again, I I've got a theory. Basically, so <laughs> much happened to me in such a short period of time. Like you know, I met yeah. everyone. Yeah, I met David Bowie, yeah. and I met like. I mean, Destiny's Child, Beyonce. I did so much in such a short period of time that actually all the detail gets hazy because, like, it was just so much for my little brain to take in. And what about, uh, you mentioned David Bowie. Tell me about that. I met David Bowie at um, the uh, MTV Music Awards. This is, again, when I was 14 in uh, New York. I just presented an award with Wyclef Jean to Eminem. 
Um, and the stereophonics <laughs> were there. I was hanging out with the stereophonics because we were oh, Welsh. Were they? Yeah, and it was me and my mum. And I just remember being like, oh, God, it was so embarrassing to be there with my mum. You know, she's just pointing at everybody. Who's that? Who's that man with looks like he got a pineapple on his head? That's Buster Rhymes. Who's that? Um, <laughs> and just being like, oh, gosh, why am I here with my mum? I just wish I was here with my friends. And um, my mother, it was who's a really big <laughs> Bowie fan. I am now, consequently, a massive Bowie fan, but I wasn't at the time. Um, yeah. And he was there backstage. I can't remember who he's chatting to with Iman. And I, you know, I just I was just looking at her, and her face was so symmetrical. She was so beautiful. And yeah, they were just chatting to somebody else. And my mum tapped him on the shoulder and said, "Oh, can you have a photo with my daughter?" And he was like, yeah, sure. And he tootied down. He had a little photo with me. My mum had a disposable camera. And he was just lovely, you know, again. Good God. It's not like I haven't, I, because I was a kid, as an adult now, meeting all these people, I would have talked the hind legs off a donkey to him. Do you know what I mean? I would have been so curious and fascinated mm -hmm. and like, just mm -hmm. like in it. I love a chat. Proper Welsh. And um, but at that point, you know, as as a slightly awkward teenager who is going through a lot, you just you know, I was yeah. I just took it all in. Really, I was very much on receive. I just sort of tried to absorb it all. Well, that's very nice because a lot of performers are on transmit, and and yeah. find it very difficult to find the receive switch. Uh, in, in in my experience. Uh, that can yeah. often be the case. Tell me about perceptions of you and how they've changed over the years. To what extent have you been aware of how you are perceived? You never really know, can you? But and and how comfortable you are with that, and that taking you to to where you are now, which is a very different place. I think I'm a very self-aware person, and I think I have been since I was quite young. And it's difficult not to be aware of how you're being perceived when you're constantly being written about. I became famous at a time which was particularly toxic for women and for working class women. Yes, and so, yes. you know, gr growing up in that really toxic culture, which was based around a very narrow view of what women could be in society and what it looked like mm -hmm. for women to be successful and how sexualized we all were as young women. Um, but but also then as a working class woman, how, you know, that narrative of the the angels fallen from grace and, you know, going out with bad boys. It, it, it's brutal to to go through. I go back to what I was saying earlier when you said about the age you were, and I just went, oh, you know, I've got, a lot of children and uh, the youngest ones now are 14 and 11 and they're going through all sorts of changes and, the th and, and, and making mistakes and discoveries and so on. The thought of them doing that in the public eye would break my heart. I mean, yeah. it, would, it would destroy me to, to see, and, and you experience that, but things, things are changing and hopefully in the long term for the better. Because one of the things I want to talk to you about is this amazing thing you've done with is it laura ashley's old house yes which is right in the heart of mid wales yes it which is sounds remarkable laura ashley fashion designer based in wales lovely house um where exactly in wales is the house so it's just outside of a beautiful town called freida literally five minutes from the elan valley it's so beautiful it's. I think it's the least densely populated area of Britain. It is really wild there. It's really wild, really rugged. Um, and I'd never, before going to see this house, um, I was basically looking for a patch of land to start a glamping business because I wanted to right. set up a business which was more in line with my values and, you know, just really something that was... Um, drawing people towards the outdoors and nature connection. And, and I'm very, very passionate about um, helping people reconnect with nature. And um, and I saw this yeah. house and the house was a shell, but I've been on a, a two year um, Herculean project, building project to 
um, breathe some life and love back into this gorgeous house and this and this beautiful bit of land, this beautiful bit of Wales. And if people are, are listening to this now and saying that sounds amazing, they can see it. Tell us the channels because this has all been filmed. Yeah. Which channels do people need to go to to see this? So it was on really really uk um which is a, a, a part of the discovery yes. channel i think it's on amazon prime and the other one <laughs> i think it's on amazon prime and netflix now but yes i made a, a se- two series actually called charlotte church's dream build which follows the the, the build yeah. of the project but we're also open now so we're open as a retreat center right. um and we're basically focused on and um, we uh on nature connection, sound healing, and ceremony. Yeah. So it's there's, there are many, many ways and there, to connect people back to themselves, back to each other, back to the land. Um, and there are also many ways to do well-being and engage in well-being practices which don't feel preachy or it doesn't feel like too much of an excavation of sort of, you know, any trauma or anything like that. What we do is very much based on things being joyful, joyful and gentle. And I think that people's nervous systems in this modern day, because of the the pace of life, because, because of having these little mobile phones in our pockets, which are const- a constant yes. draw for our attention, our nervous systems are fried. Um, and we find it very difficult mm-hmm. to to sort of switch off and to to not be sort of um, entertained, you know, just to just to sort of do nothing, put everything down. Um, and so that's that's what I'm hoping the dreaming can do for people. And that's that's what the place is called, the dreaming. And I was reading some of the stuff you can do there, and this does sound lovely. Let me read some of this. Uh, what, what, for example, is a sound healing journey? So I do lots of the sound healing journeys there. I'm a, a practitioner now. And a sound healing journey is using um, lots of different instruments. Uh, some of them like big gongs. Gongs are the big massive metal. Um, yeah. Using crystal bowls. Using lots of instruments which are highly resonant which create like yes. a really resonant um, soundscape. I do a lot of singing in my sound journeys. Think about how impactful music is on your sense of, on your emotional self, on your on your emotional regulation. You know, whether it's at a funeral and there's a particularly poignant song played, which meant a lot, whether it's at a wedding and it's a first dance. Music is, is very important for, to, to help move us through different emotional states, different parts of life. And with a sound journey, um, if you're thinking about the universe as energy, which is what it is, everything is energy, then everything has a vibration. Practically, how does it work? I'm imagining people sitting in a circle. Is it dark? I mean, what, 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 how does it work? It's a low light. People are laying down on lovely comfy. We've got these lovely... Um, like mattresses and people are laying down, they've got a blanket. Mm. The aim is for people to be very, very comfortable. So we start with a rainscape. We create the sound of rain by using all sorts of different instruments, rain sticks, little drums, different techniques for creating these sonic landscapes. And then it moves from rain into um, air and wind and the wind starts to pick up. And then we sort of create a thunderstorm. Um, and so for m- in my sound journey, my sound journey gets quite intensive. Before then, we release people. And then we go into the sort of the really beautiful, celestial, very clean, very pure sounds. And then I'm sort of harmonizing and singing different improvised melodies around the resonances of the gongs and the bowls and you hit certain notes and certain frequencies and it like and it excites the particles in the room. It's so cool. It's a small group of people. Maximum we can have 15 people. So it's a really small group of people and you're really pouring so much love and nurture into creating this, this sort of healing sonic 
um, landscape for people to re- feel really held, really nurtured, really able to totally let go and relax. So it really um, activates something called theta brainwaves. Um, and theta brainwaves is is a similar s- sort of place that you get to during meditation. That sounds very up my street. Yeah, um, you should come I'm and visit very us. Aware. Well, I could come and you know do a quick song. Oh or, yeah, or, 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 or not a song, maybe just a poem. I uh, the, the 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 power of sound and and the mind. Um, I mean, it's it's at the other end of the scale, but I use that that calm app sometimes. If you wake up at night and they've got different soundscapes on that. Now, that, that's a very, I suppose you would say, compared to what you're doing, it's a very basic rudimentary thing. But just hearing rain on a tent or whatever it is, it does something, takes your mind somewhere else, takes you out of yourself. Which yeah, is a lovely totally. Thing. If people want to come to the dreaming in beautiful mid Wales, yeah. If they come, are they guaranteed that you're going to be there singing? You're not going to be there all the time, surely. I'm there every Tuesday and Wednesday, so I'm there on all of the midweek um, retreats. I'm there on some of the weekend retreats, but oh. not all of them. It's something that I'm really passionate about. I'm really proud of. I think is really going to help people. And what about good old fashioned singing? Will there be any more albums? Will there be any more tours? Absolutely, absolutely. So all good. Okay. Yeah, I'm. I'm. Um, I'm cooking up some stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Um, well, uh, this I, is I'm, this is tantalising. I'm feeling um, more and more myself nowadays. You know, I think as you get older. You start to really grow. If you're lucky, well, not just lucky, if you do the work to be able to to be peaceful and to be a bit more comfortable with yourself, yeah. then you can sort of really start bringing forth the essence of, of what is you and that wildness. Because we are all, we're nature. We are nature. So we are all wild. Yeah. And I think that what musically, what I'm going to do next is going to really embody that. Well, that's a tantalising way to finish. Um, (laughs) Charlotte, I've really enjoyed talking to you. I've really enjoyed talking to you as well, Rob. Thank you. Well, we will will meet up in in the flesh at some time. Come and visit us at the Dreaming. We would love to have you at the Dreaming. I could come and maybe read a story or something. Yeah, totally. Lush, delightful. Lush, tidy, cracking. I love it. Lush, tidy. Charlotte, thanks a lot. (laughs) All the very best to you. Thank you, you Rob. Bye-bye. Really, really lovely to chat. Lots of love. Bye-bye.